Hi. Hey. <laughs> Good evening, and thanks for coming, everybody. For those of you who don't know, don't know me, um, I guess this is not working. Uh, my name is uh, Jim, and I am the dean of the law school. And it's my pleasure to all welcome all of you to the fourth or forty-fourth, forty-fourth annual uh, Austin W. Scott lecture. Um, the Scott lecture was established in 1973 by former Dean Don Sears um, in memory of Professor Austin Scott, uh, who taught at the law school for uh, 20 years. Uh, Professor Scott excelled both as a as a teacher and as a scholar. And every year, we select a member of the faculty who. Uh, reflects this excellent to, uh, this excellence to give the the Scott lecture. Um, as you can see from the list of uh, previous lectures in your program, uh, it is indeed a distinguished uh, list and uh, of, of lectures. And so that selection as a Scott lecture uh, really is an indication of a remarkable distinction uh, and uh, achievement. Uh, and so I'm happy to uh, announce this evening or, or to. Um, to, to uh, welcome our speaker for this evening, uh, Scott uh, Moss, to give the Scott lecture uh, <laughs> uh, and add him to this distinguished lecture, list of lectures. Um, allow me uh, to, uh, to take a few moments to say a few words about Professor uh, Scott Moss, who will give the Scott lecture. Uh, he came to us from Marquette University Law School, uh, joining us from um, joining the University of Colorado Law School in 2007. Uh, he currently holds the Shadden Chair in Experiential Learning. Um, uh, before becoming an academic, he practiced law, litigating extensively uh, at the trial and appellate levels. Uh, Professor Moss continues to litigate, uh, lit litigate as time allows, uh, mainly on a pro bono basis. And his experience litigating um, allows uh, him to uh, gain insights that contribute enorm enormously to his scholarship, as, as we will see. Um, in, as we will hear from in the, in the lecture. Uh, as this evening uh, lecture reflects, Professor Moss is especially interested in analyzing and propo proposing reforms to federal litigation practice and procedure. Uh, in addition to being uh, a scholar and a practicing lawyer, Professor Moss is a highly regarded teacher, uh, winning teaching and other awards at both institutions where he taught, including the campus, a wide Student Affairs Faculty Member of the Year Award. Uh, for several years, uh, he's applied his considerable skill to serve as the chair of the Admissions Committee, uh, a position that uh, we know he'll miss when he is no longer the chair next year. Uh, tonight, we're privileged to uh, hear Professor Moss address what he refers to as a second class class action. And by that, he refers, I believe, to statutory collective wage actions, right, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we'll hear how the procedural treatment of these actions uh, may impact the ability of workers to pursue rights vindicating cl claims. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Scott Moss to present. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, can everybody hear me OK? Just want to make sure I don't usually have a problem not being loud enough, but who knows how these microphones work. Uh, thanks, Jim, for the too generous introduction. Um, I should normally share credit with my co-author, Nantia Ruan, uh, but instead I'll give her a big boo tonight because I'm here and she is on vacation in Bali, which is why she can't be here. So boo Nantia if you're watching this eventually. Um, but Nantia and I are uh, close friends. We met actually 18 years ago when I was the first associate and she was the second associate at our old employment law firm litigating, among other things, wage collective actions. So this is an old interest of mine and then I went into teaching. I didn't really revisit the field until uh, 2012 with this article that NT and I wrote in 2012. And um, by the way, I'll add that although you may notice there's a publication and publication date, if you're especially observant, you may note that the publication date has not happened yet, because it's 2019. Um, the article is complete, but in very drafty form. So if anybody's inclined, I brought a stack. If you, say, have insomnia problems, then I'd be happy to give you this 57-page monstrosity for you to read tonight or read to your children if you want to dissuade them from going to law school, for example. <laughs> so um, quickly, a summary and preview first. Um, class actions versus collective actions. 
most people know what a class action is. It's a lawsuit filed by one, five, or nine, or however many people on behalf of a large class of folks with about the same claim. A collective action is different. As I'll get into, there's a specific statute that predates the class action rule that governs wage actions that are brought by many workers together. They treat them much the same by the courts. That much was uncontroversial. We disagreed with that. That was the point of our 2012 article that we'll get into. And that was our response to the case law. Then judges responded to our response by arguing pro and con and mixed on what we said, and also flagging issues we didn't anticipate, which is a lot of what is behind us writing an article seven years later. Now, because uh, judges brought up some good points, we didn't. If all that happens is we wrote an article, some people liked it, some people didn't like it, then we just move on to the next thing. But we realized that we neglected to say all that we could or should. So what I'm mostly talking about today, though, is the current article. To be sure, I'm going to summarize the old article, then the new article. Fortunately, I talk fast, you may have noticed. So today's article is our response to the judge's response to our response. So at some point, this is starting to sound like a crappy song from the 60s by the Love Generation. They had the you knew, that I knew, the you knew, that I knew line. So we're starting to be wheels within wheels with the Matryoshki Russian dolls or something like that. But be that as it may, pick your metaphor that's overwrought here. Um, we at least realized that more was warranted for us to write because we need to take a closer look. Because what we'll detail uh, in the article is that if 216B collective actions, the provision they're under, are neither class actions nor individual cases entirely, then that raises a host of issues that we didn't fully address. What are they if they're not class actions or individual cases? What rules apply? And if you don't have the class action rules, which are well established and detailed as a roadmap, yet you need more than the rules for individual cases, then how do you litigate or adjudicate these things? Um, essentially, we needed to address these issues because some of the response to our article was that in deciding that the way collective actions were litigated was wrong, but not really detailing an alternative, then we were an excellent example of the old aphorism that it takes a lot of hard work, effort, and skill to build a barn, but any jackass can kick one down. And we were those jackasses, kicking down the barn of class actions. And this is getting away from me here, so I'll move on. The other question you may think of, though, in addition to what, which, and how is, I've never heard of collective action, so why does this matter? Who cares? And when are you done talking? And in fact, there are class action experts who have seen this article and said, what? What is a collective action? And there's a reason this isn't a terribly known thing. It's specific to one area of practice, wage law. But it's an area that always mattered if you had a wage claim or practice in the area. But it's starting to matter more and more. So as to why does this matter? Who cares? This is why. This is a graph of FLSA, that's the Fair Labor Standards Act, the federal set of wage laws. Cases filed by calendar year. If you're especially good at graphs, you may notice it's been going up fairly rapidly, which is that there used to be, you know, 1,000 a year, a little under, uh, that were filed. Now, the Fair Labor Standards Act dates back to 1938. It was a New Deal program to guarantee a minimum and overtime wage for all workers. And it accomplished some things, didn't accomplish others. Um, if anything, what's remarkable is how it didn't until it hit about elderly age, until the old law was in its 60s or 70s, start to really get used a lot. To be sure, 1,000 cases isn't nothing. It's more than 900 and fewer than 1,100, I guess. But a lot of the significant cases were mainly by the Department of Labor, and there were only so many of them. But what really happened is this, which is that in 1991, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1991. That was an employment discrimination law. Big deal at the time. It really expanded the field of employment discrimination practice. A lot more lawsuits got filed because there came to be more damages in the field. Well, once Congress sicked a larger and larger plaintiff's employment bar on America, um, those plaintiff's lawyers eventually realized there are other laws we can sue under. And it took about seven or eight years, but they discovered the FLSA, this law that had always been there. I'm not saying it's obscure, but it wasn't used all that much. Once you had a professional plaintiff's bar in employment that had snowballed in the 90s, um, the stats are that by 2012, there's a US General Accounting Office study that said that federal wage suits increased 514% from 92 to 2012. And that was mostly in the last 10 years of that. Some other stats just to show 514%, large number, but 
you know, 514% of one lawsuit is 5.14 lawsuits. It's actually a lot. As of now, one out of 30 federal court cases is a wage suit. And if you look at federal question cases, excluding the diversity, car accident, or contract type cases, 10% of non-prisoner federal question cases are wage suits. So it's an area that's become one of the most significant fields of practice. And I'll add also that, as one plaintiff's lawyer who does this area of practice said, wage violations are like cockroaches in your walls. If you see one, it means you got a thousand. Because sure, there are individual cases by one worker, one kitchen manager who's misclassified. But a lot of these cases are against some major entity, either a large employer, large restaurant, or a multi-site employer, retailer, what have you, construction, um, agriculture, in which if, so, if there's a practice of not paying for a certain time, it probably spans dozens, hundreds, thousands of workers. So these are not only one of the larger now sets of federal cases in federal courts, but they're disproportionately pretty large. And the way they get large is with the collective action procedure. I'll also add that an even newer development is more state laws with a $12 to $15 minimum. Colorado passed one a couple of years ago. More and more states are. That doesn't expand federal litigation, but it expands the damages that are available if someone works off the clock or alleges that they did so and didn't get paid, suddenly their damages are higher. So wage litigation is continuing to expand and is already one of the bigger practice areas. So um, that on the one hand, it's an area that shouldn't be obscure. On the other hand, it is. I think attention tends to lag when a practice area increases. I counted the number of law review articles on the FLSA and specifically on the collective action procedure, not just wage rights. And we're talking one or two a year, law review articles, on litigation of FLSA claims as collective actions. Is that a lot or a little? Well, it's one topic, but it's a lot fewer than the number of papers on Rule 23, class actions, or various other things. So I think it's somewhat of an understudied field, less and less so. It's catching up, but that's part of what drove me to write this paper in, 20, this paper in 2012 and then again in 2019, the follow-up. So preview, primer, review, depending on whether you took Cipro. Rule 23 class actions are the way that almost any claim is litigated when it's shared by a lot of folks. There are four requirements in Rule 23A. There's to be numerosity of plaintiffs. They have to have common questions among their claims. The claims of the named plaintiffs who are suing for everybody have to be typical of the group. And class counsel and the lead plaintiffs have to be adequate to represent the class. The court scrutinizes these. And if it's a damages class action, B3 adds that there's an opt-out right, and the plaintiffs have to show two more things. Because after all, the earliest class actions that were envisioned when Rule 23 was enacted were class actions for injunctions. Whole town suing to stop a dam being built, or cause a dam to, being built, to be built, or something about a dam, I don't know. Or civil rights class actions that were injunctive. If you're suing for damages, you have a little less in common with all the other folks because you'll have a different amount, some individualized issues. So standards are a little higher, for a damages class action than one seeking an injunction. Plaintiffs have to show a class that action is superior to other alternatives, like many plaintiffs just suing alone, and have to show that these common questions that they have to prove not only exist, but predominate over the individual questions. So that's class action practice, and under 23C, plaintiffs have to prove these elements, A and B3, on a motion with evidence. This is unusual. Normally, you get to file a lawsuit. You hire your lawyer. You decide to file or not. You settle or not, it's all up to you. None of it's up to you if you're a class action plaintiff or lawyer. You have to get approval from the court for everything you do. The court has this gatekeeper role to protect the absent members. So if you're litigating as the named plaintiffs or class counsel, a case that has five plaintiffs litigating for 1,000 individuals, the court wants to make sure the five are doing right by the 1,000. And the court scrutinizes, therefore, what's done. In contrast, if those five plaintiffs sue for just themselves, they can do what they want. They can file or not. They can hire a great lawyer, a terrible lawyer. They can settle for pennies or for a lot. Court doesn't have any say. That's class actions. In contrast, collective actions are what exists for wage claims and two other types that are a little less common uh, in the employment realm. And that's because when Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act in 1938 then amended it in 1937, modern class actions didn't exist. Modern Rule 23 wasn't going to be enacted for another three decades. So Congress passed a provision in the Fair Labor Standards Act that basically is a mini class action provision. A lawsuit can be maintained for other employees similarly situated. Each plaintiff, though, must give consent in writing filed in the court. It's an opt-in case, 
not an opt-out case. That is, when you have a damages class action, if you're suing not for wages but for some expenses or costs, well, everybody's in unless he or she opts out if the court certifies the class action. Here, though, no individual is included unless he or she opts in by filing something. What's the process, though? Well, the statute is pretty silent. This is almost the entirety of the text that I gave you in these snippets. It basically becomes a longer sentence, a couple other phrases. Not much. Nothing like the 23A through, I think we're up to F or G in uh, class actions these days. Maybe H, I lost track. So um, courts handling 216B collective actions started adopting a Rule 23C style certification motion. That is, plaintiffs have the burden of producing evidence, proving that the case should be certified as a class or collective action. Here's an example, just a recent case from D. Colorado, citing a 10th Circuit case that's a leading one, both in our circuit and nationally. Similarly situated, the 216B standard is judged in two stages. There's a preliminary notice stage, then a more searching substantive stage after discovery. Plaintiffs have to show to have a collective action that the members are victims of a single decision, policy, or plan to deprive wages. Now, um, you may wonder what's up with these colors here. Now, one answer is that I have terrible aesthetic judgment in life, as you know, my wife could tell you about my sense of fashion. Um, I had to get some advice on what tie and things like that. But no, there's actually a point here, which is this. I was trying to pair up what we can from 216B with what we can in Rule 23. Rule 23 is a commonality requirement. 216B is a similarly situated requirement. Not a lot of detail, but similar, common. Those are similar and common words. And then we have a further additional requirement of a predomination of common questions. There must not only be some commonality, but mostly commonality. This is not dissimilar to the single decision policy or plan requirement. The common questions have to be dominant. And then there's a requirement in 23C of the plaintiff proving these things, commonality and predomination. And so too in 216B, the case law, the court says, we have a searching substantive stage after discovery, meaning after plaintiffs gather their proof and have to show it, where the plaintiffs have to show these things. In other words, what I'm trying to do with the colors is show that courts have basically interpreted 216B almost exactly like a 23B3 class. They require not only common issues, similar issues, but that the common or similar issues predominate or part of a single plan that dominates the facts, and the plaintiffs have to prove it with evidence and a searching substantive inquiry. So basically, a 216B case is treated like a Rule 23B3 class. Um, we disagreed. Uh, we said that if you look back at the history of 216B, it was adopted in 1947 in amendments to the Fair Labor Standards Act, some of the language dated back to 1938. At the time, there was an old Rule 23 that allowed opt-in classes, much like 216B. And it's quite close, the standard for these old Rule 23 opt-in classes, sometimes called spurious class actions, is close to modern joinder. Because if plaintiffs had joint interests, that is, they all had an interest in the same property or res, well then, the class must include everybody. That's like Rule 19, necessary party joinder. In contrast, if plaintiffs have separate but similar interests, that is, many individuals with damages claims that are separate but they're somewhat similar, then individuals can join if they're common questions, but it's not automatic. That's very much like Rule 20, optional joinder. So in this slide, the 216B collective action, when it was enacted, it isn't, as courts seem to say it to see it today, a liberalized but similar form of, it, it isn't a stricter form of a current Rule 23B3 class. It's not akin to a current damages class. Current Rule 23 didn't exist at the time. Instead, it was a liberalized form of old Rule 23 joinder, the 1938 version of spurious class actions that were basically liberalized joinder. And if you look at the text of 216B, there's nothing about certification. The sole standard is similarly situated. There's nothing about A1 through 4, B3, those requirements. And if you go further into the purposes, the Rule 23 proof requirements of commonality, predomination, adequate representatives, the purpose is to protect absent class members, the other 995 out of the 1,000 class members who aren't there, from information flaws and cost in the decisions being made, specifically Principal agent problems, the named plaintiffs and their attorneys can exploit the class. There are criticisms of some consumer class actions for basically giving the class very little, coupons and the like, but giving the class counsel millions of dollars. 
I'll set to one side whether I agree or disagree. Not my field, not an expert. But that's the sort of thing that is feared when the vast majority of the class isn't there, of the people being litigated for. Relating to their coordination problems, even if you don't have nefarious intent or greed, if you have heterogeneous preferences among the plaintiffs, whether they want an injunction or wages, whether they want to fix the practices or just get back pay, or what level of tolerance they have for a compromise, it's hard to coordinate among that many plaintiffs, so the courts impose some duties, and Rule 23 does, to respect the preferences of the class. Uh, their search costs, it's quite hard to find all these plaintiffs, so there's a bit of a fiduciary obligation. The case law says courts impose on named plaintiffs and counsel. So if you can't contact everybody, then you have to act as their fiduciary. And that redresses some of the information problems. After all, they're plaintiffs who just aren't going to get it if you try to explain to them real nuances of the math or of injunctive relief. So there are information processing problems that justify some greater protections here and intrusiveness. Very little of this applies to 216B. Every plaintiff opted in. So every plaintiff made a decision that at least he or she thinks he, underst he or she understands this case enough to opt in, be represented by uh, the plaintiffs or their counsel. Nobody's absent. There's nobody who doesn't know what's going on. And class counsel has the contact information of everybody because everybody opted in. So there's a strong basis in the past uh, history, text, and the purposes and policy of the rule to not say that we are imposing on 216B collective actions all these strictures that we normally don't impose on litigation. Judicial second guessing of your choice of attorney, settlement terms, what claims you're pressing, and the conduct of the case. So, what was the response to this? Well, I had two expectations for the judicial response to this. Here's the first, crickets. I didn't expect judges were gonna read this or care. Uh, and if they read it, I expected the response to be something like this. As a wise woman once said, I don't care what you think, I don't think about you at all. Like Coco Chanel. So, I, as with most articles I write, I'm under no delusion a lot of people are going to read this. Um, so surprise, there ended up being this three-way split among case law. Um, some courts agreed, some courts disagreed, and there was this strange third category that I even less expected. Um, so I code them with a very complex system of emoticons here. Uh, I had to Google for this one because I didn't know what I could use, but hey, I learned a lot in prepping this lecture. So <laughs> the first case was from the U.S. Court of Claims. The first thing I did when I saw this, I said, wow, that's... This is interesting. I wonder what a court of claims is. I'll spare you the details of it. Claims against the federal government. So, McClendon v. U.S., the court said, after plaintiffs filed a motion for certification of their collective action, the FLSA doesn't require you to get certification. The court denies plaintiff's motion as unnecessary, see generally article. Then a couple of cases cited McClendon. Johnson said, well, plaintiffs didn't move for certification, and defendants said, therefore, the case should be dismissed. No, that doesn't require dismissal, see McClendon, that just means that if plaintiffs didn't make a motion, they just don't need to facilitate notice. More on that later, but you don't have to file for certification. Citing McClendon. Alderati, D. Maryland. Because all employees who join opt in, it would be unfair to impose a more stringent initial barrier than Rule 20 joinder. Because I'm familiar, this is from an article. Uh, 216B doesn't describe any judicial role in certifying, and that's been cited in support of the argument that any cert process conflicts with the language. Instead, Rule 20 and Rule 21 should apply. That should be the standard. And cited our articles for that. Um, and then it all the fan with a Turner case in D, Colorado um, from Judge Kane. Um, who actually was going to be here tonight, then couldn't, but bummer. Um, so in the Turner case, is against Chipotle, a pretty standard, Fair Labor Standards Act collective action that restaurant workers were not given this or that, X minutes a day of break time, setup time, et cetera. And if you're a low-wage plaintiff, that quickly takes you below the minimum wage. If you're at or near minimum wage and not paid for X percent of your hours, your effective wage is lower. Or it's an overtime violation if you work 40 hours officially but add a couple more hours each week of labor. So the first holding was no cert is required. Um, cert has no place in the FLSA, Judge Kane wrote. Myers cases thwarts wage earners' rights. I agree with those guys. Um, that calling for certification the FLSA. It's haphazard terminology, misunderstanding of present, legislative intent. I feel like, super excited, because I've always been a big fan of Judge Kane, and I felt like he was doing like the Billy Crystal Oscar medley of my article, like just <laughs> phrases here and there. Um, so uh, certification was triggered by imprecise pleading, and courts just um, undergoing path dependence and lock-in, where we traced it back. There's this one case 
called the Seder, that we think is the patient zero of why are they doing this. And it was a Rule 23 class for some state claims, but also a 216B collective action with the federal claims. And the court, it was in D, New Jersey, so it applied the same standards for both, essentially. And courts just started following that, saying, yeah, let's do that. And we think, no, that's not how you do it. Uh, the only 216B requirement, uh, Judge Kane concludes, that consent is to be filed. If you file a consent, you're in. When you're a JIT, you're a JIT till the end. And then he says that collective actions differ fundamentally. Only those who opt a mistake removing any rationale for the Rule 23 rigorous requirements. So basically bought the arguments. Um, I do want to say I feel compelled to give a big disclaimer that I'm under no delusion that Judge Kane, who I think is amazing, um, thinks I'm generally an intelligent person or write about most things because I wrote my article in 2012. He issued this decision in 2015. In between, I did a pro bono trial of an FLSA claim for an immigrant cook in his court. I got with a bench trial, and I was very soundly defeated in very, not quite stern tones, but it was a very decisive decision that I was completely wrong and had no idea what I'm talking about. So it was crushing. Uh, you know, it took me a couple of months to get over that, or I'll let you know when I get over it. But in a sense, sometimes, you know, bad things in life are an exercise in humility, because without that, I might be tempted to overstate this and say, Judge Kane's amazing, and he agreed with something, so by syllogism, I'm amazing. No, he thinks I'm about one for two in FLSA arguments about whether I have a point or I'm just completely out to lunch in filing this insane claim that I took to trial. Um, that said, um, he also agreed that 216B is leading joinder and it's defendant's burden to challenge commonality. Also, what we argued, 216B is more lenient than joinder. There's no requirement of a single decision policy or plan. Um, after all, virtually all collective actions the courts reject for not having a single plan or the same supervisor, same duties. They actually meet what should be the right standard, the joinder standard of a single common issue. So, and that traces to original 216B being liberalized joinder because it was modeled on old Rule 23, which was basically a joinder class action that drew a distinction only between mandatory joinder and permissive joinder. And that's the Rule 19 and 20 standard for joinder. So the proper approach is presumptively allow a 216B if it's the same statutory claim against the same employer. They might get severed later, just as any case filed on behalf of two to 1,000 plaintiffs. The court could decide they need separate trials or separate proceedings. But until then, you handle as a joinder case. Defendant can file a motion under Rule 21 arguing this joinder, separate them. Or there can be severance under Rule 42, more typically later by trial. Fine, the claims had enough to not be separated under Rule 21 in discovery, but maybe you try them separately so you sever them. Those are the vehicles for challenging collective action. Otherwise, the claims stay consolidated. So this went to the Tenth Circuit eventually. We got a semi-affirmance, and that's because it was a mandamus appeal. And it's mandamus because the lawyers for Chipotle freaked out and said, OK, plaintiffs move for a certification. Judge Kane, in this case and another, apparently told the lawyers, I'm not doing that anymore. You need to go home and do some more reading. And he assigned them opinions to read, as well as my article, apparently. I know this because I got a call from a lawyer I know saying, oh, Scott, I was on homework by Judge Kane in one of my wage cases. Can somebody read your article and come back in two weeks? And what do I do about this? And I said, I don't know. You're on your own, man. Um, I don't want to jump in and be too biased. But um, Chipotle freaked out at the idea that this is automatically certified, essentially, in their view. So this wasn't a final judgment that they could petition as of right. So they moved for mandamus, emergency appeal that is such an abuse of discretion that the judge basically turned into the Queen of Hearts from Alice in Wonderland and needs to be smacked down pretty hard. So the Tenth Circuit said, well, it wasn't that bad. We make no definitive determination on this approach. We merely say it's not such a gross abuse of discretion as to warrant mandamus. So the Tenth Circuit officially held that I'm not that dumb and neither is Judge Kane. Right? We're not completely crazy. Uh, but they did say a little more because they treated this seriously. I mean, some denials of mandamus go no further than, yeah, no, that's fine. But it was telling, therefore, that they went further. They provingly detailed basically all the arguments, ran through the district court, determined the certification has no place with heavy reliance on scholarship. The joinder is even more lenient than Rule 20, that because everybody's to opt in, you don't need to do this whole Rule 23 rigmarole to protect these folks who know darn well they're in a lawsuit. Courts have conflated 23 with liberalized joinder. The proper approach is presumptively allow. Conclusion, the district court hewed closely to the old Rule 23 spurious approach that Weird joinder class action from 1938 was mentioning. And misjoinder is for when there are no common questions. So I recounted all the arguments. 
and it narrowly construed the certification precedent. Now, if you go back a bit, should have put that on the screen. Um, there was 10th Circuit precedent from 2001, and this is why I was not optimistic about how the mandamus decision would go. Thiessen v. General Electric. As of 2001, the 10th Circuit blessed this two-stage certification process. And it has been followed by a zillion decisions in the 10th Circuit and around the country. So what do we do about Thiessen? There's a 10th Circuit case that says, do it this way. Judge Kane said, no thanks. So how is that going to go? Uh, Judge Kane's brilliant, but he's been known to decide that, well, if the circuit disagrees with what I'm doing in this precedent, I'm very sorry for the circuit, for they are wrong. Right? That's some nice approach he's been known to take. Um, but the 10th Circuit actually interpreted Thiessen narrowly. What it said is that defendant says Thiessen requires certification. Nothing in Thiessen says that. Thiessen said there's little difference among different approaches. Thiessen just found no error in this certification approach that everybody then copied. But we never said it was mandatory. Courts of flexibility, nothing in Thiessen describes the district court's approach. So that's a holding. That's not just, you're not so crazy that we must smack you down with the mandamus bat. Um, and then further finally said, defendants referring to a threshold determination, i.e. cert, is misplaced. There's no statutory mandate for an initial cert determination. The only requirement is similarly situated. There's actually no Supreme Court authority or 10th Circuit authority prohibiting the district court method of saying you must do cert. Defendant conflates 216B with some sort of burden to prove similarity. The district court's order is consistent with 216B. So maybe too subtle, I should use colors. This sentence and this sentence look like an actual holding. It's not dicta and not just, you're not too crazy enough to justify mandamus. So that said, not all courts agreed. Uh, these arguments have gone over extremely badly in the Second Circuit, which is sad for me because that's where I started litigating these things back in 99. Uh, one case, Augustiniak, and there are many. There's one typical one saying, some authority says anyone can consent, and it's the responsibility to defend this ever, Turner. The turn to be Chipotle. I do not agree. Burden remains with the plaintiffs. There's a mix in D Colorado. I'll get to more of that more in a minute. Beltran, a uh, case that's still ongoing. Predominance of individual questions is relevant only post discovery. So it certified a class fairly liberally, saying we're not applying too strict a predomination standard. But it did say, yeah, we're still doing certification. It didn't expressly reject Turner, but I happen to know this judge knows of the Turner issue and the uh, 216B issue, but Therefore, it's telling the judges didn't want to touch this issue with a 10-foot pole. And then Second Circuit actually didn't cite Turner or article, but it clearly said, we are applying the 23B3 standard still. Plaintiffs there, Gladby Fox Searchlight, had the same pay, same job, same employer. But the court said, there's not enough commonality. And we are disallowing a Rule 23B3 class, as to state claims, and the 23B collective for the same reasons. Um, that is, plaintiffs of the show, common questions predominate under B3, and the same reasons apply to 216B. Um, that's the similarly situated standard. So the Second Circuit is expressly saying you have to show predomination. It's a B3 class. Um, and then there's this unexpected third option, where courts agreed with the diagnosis that 216Bs are joiners, not class actions. But they disagree in the prescription. They said, therefore, it should be much harder to litigate a collective action. Here's where they went with that. Older Shaw v. DeVita Healthcare Partners, and there's a third D. Colorado judge, and there's six D. Colorado judges that now have somewhat different views on this one in different clusters. Um, it agreed, so start off with the smiley face. 216B cert is a misnomer, unlike the more significant Rule 23 cert. Court agrees. Judge Kane was careful and thoughtful that conditional cert is a misnomer because it's just a vehicle for giving notice to other employees. Approval's lenient. CERT under Rule 23 is more significant, different purposes, protecting absent people. But then, you get the squiggly here, because then the court concluded, so therefore, a 216B lawsuit is not a representative case at all. It's a collection of individual cases. 216B is fundamentally different from a class action. There's no representation by anyone. A 216B named plaintiff, not even an opt-in, but the one who filed for others, has no interest in the collective, just an individual claim. Opt-ins then also become people with individual claims. So therefore, settlement and discovery trial evidence must be individual. Everybody must come to court to offer their evidence. 23, Rule 23 claims can be settled through negotiation with representatives. 216B claims have to be negotiated individually. And then follow-up opinions in that case and others. And I'm getting redder and redder for you know, danger, danger here. Um, I like my color coding. Two similar decisions. One, different judge. 
ordered live depositions of all opt-in plaintiffs because each is a plaintiff proceeding on her own individual claim. Another one said that to have a settlement, each opt-in plaintiff has to be informed and secured individual consent. And some of these cases had hundreds of people. On average, mostly 100, a little under, a little over, but hey, over 100 depositions is a lot. And I've had a case where it was just FLSA, and I thought about whether I had to get 500 individual consents to settle. Fortunately, the court didn't make us. Would have been prohibitive. So uh, with that, where the cases still got worse and worse and worse, felt a little like Lando Calrissian telling Darth Vader, this deal is getting worse and worse all the time, um, as it just got redder and redder. So we're displeased with this case law. We're saying, what, that? No, that's not what we were talking about. So intermission. Got an email last month. Hey, I'm wondering if we can talk to you about a pithier title. I thought, pithier than 24 words with phrases like second class class action and a summary that has a lot of 216Bs and section signs in it. Sure. So I'll show you some of the alternate titles that NT and I texted back and forth. Um, this one, watch how catchy this is. A second take on second class class action, second guessing, second rate case law, you have a second set of mistakes. <laughs> That'd really roll off the tongue. I thought, you know, there's a game I like to play with a friend at faculty meetings. What's the worst thing you could say here? And there's a similar one here. What is the worst title I could give this thing if I want any journal to ever consider publishing it? And I came up with this one. Or I came up with class clowns. Get the class. Yeah. <laughs> Judges screw up 216B yet again. Oops, I did it again. Lost in the game. A fool in so many ways. That's actually just three Britney Spears lyrics. Um, or this one, which is sort of my personal favorite. Um, you know, if I were still the guy in my 20s who was litigating these things, writing stuff like this in my 216B briefs, maybe I would have gone with that. But you know, I'm a mature man of his 40s now, I guess, sort of. So, um, but just stressing how much this case law disturbed us. Right? We're like, what did they do? We wrote about how you shouldn't have to certify these things. And a lot of the point of our 2012 article is that when you require certification in what are often low-income worker claims, this really thwarts the ability to litigate these things because it adds cost, it adds delay, and importantly, a 216B case, unlike a Rule 23 class, there's no tolling of the limitations period while you find people to opt in. So if you add this element of delay where you can't get opt-in cards until there's discovery and emotion, months go by and some people will be gone from their two to three year limitations period, setting aside the cost and the burden, and a lot of these folks are quite needy of these wages. So if you turn a case that should be a streamlined procedure, into one that has basically 23 B3 procedures because of strictures that trace to concerns about absent members that are irrelevant to 216B, you're getting the worst of both worlds. You're getting the complexity of Rule 23 without any of the need that drove it. So that was our argument. So we were really disturbed by this case law. Um, so we saw this case law as court saying, you're right, and it makes things much, much worse. It's as if we not only didn't try to solve a problem, it made it worse. It's sort of like we were the Medieval doctors putting leeches on diseased patients, right? Like, we're doing some treatment. We suggested something. It made things much, much worse. So our two stages of grief, this was the first one. Um, the second stage was to realize, though, that these decisions, this third option in particular cases, raise serious questions about what you do without certification or court scrutiny. Specifically, notice to potential opt-ins that they have the right to opt-in. When is it proper? Well, the fear answer is that if the court never certified these cases, there's no court-approved notice. There are, in fact, ethics restrictions on solicitation if you're not a class lawyer who's been certified as representing these folks. How do you solicit them? And if there's any notice, some decisions in this third category have said, since the plaintiff's lawyers are trying to contact people who they aren't certified to represent, the notice is mostly disclaimers and limits on plaintiff's counsel. You didn't have to represent them. You didn't have to do this. You could have a separate case, et cetera. How do you settle a collective action? Well, some judges said, no, you can't. It must be one by one. And the court would review the settlement, mainly to assure that it wasn't done collectively, that everyone consent individually. What about representative evidence? If the named plaintiffs represent others, then a couple people get deposed, offer documents, then you're done with discovery. No, have 100 depositions or more, these cases are saying. Um, so our response, so first, our premise that 216B still creates representative actions. The text of 216B literally does say that a suit can be filed by one or more employees for and in behalf of, strange use of prepositions back in 1938 and 47, for and in behalf of other employees, similar situations. This is a couple years after they stopped spelling Congress, Congress, I guess. But it's still strange. But 
It, clearly, they're saying that lawsuit is for others, in behalf of others. They're describing a representative action. And that like the opt-in language, file a consent in writing. It's not a rule about whether opt-ins become represented. It's about how they become represented for and in behalf of others. The legislative history, uh, Nantia more than I did, I'll give her uh, all the props for that, the deep dive into some legislative history, including, for example, this congressional hearing. And maybe I'm being naive, but um, while Congress and politics in America were generally much worse in every way back then, there still were congressional hearings maybe in which people tried to figure out facts. Maybe I'm being naive, but this exchange. Chair asks, so there's one man representing all the workers to do the suing? Yes. Instead of one man simply suing together before the court? That's right. There was testimony that showed that Congress was trying to figure out what is this language, what would it do? And there wasn't then a challenge saying, no, that's not what it was by some sponsor. And the contemporaneous understanding, 1944 district court decision, just explaining what this is, one of the earlier ones. Congress broadened the usual procedure of all claimants go to court and testify. Evidently, by having in mind this 216B simplification, claimants can come in groups, right, where not everybody shows up. There's a whole group represented by a subset. And the commentary at the time, just a law review article, saying that it's some form of group action. 216B is authority for a group action just independent of the usual class action rule, the old ones in effect then. So our argument is that before we get into specifics of notice, settlement, or evidence, the cases in this third category holding that because 216B uses joinder, it's not a representative action, I think it's a mistaken premise yielding bad conclusions. Courts say because it's not a representative action, you need evidence from everybody. You can't settle as a group. You can't give notice to people. No, it is a representative action. It's just a misunderstanding. It's just a representative action with the joinder device. So um, as to specific issues now, OK, but what do you do about notice and evidence? Well, existing practice is that courts will approve the content of a notice. And the purpose is to inform workers before the deadline runs. And then as long as there is a collective action, it's more efficient to invite people to join than to have their own suit. Courts manage the opt-ins with deadlines. After all, you don't want a case that goes through discovery, then five more people opt in the day before trial. And the necessity varies. In a small case, a case driven by a union or a workers' collective, or if everyone's local, you might not need notice, but in many you do. But the problem is courts won't approve notice without finding a collective proper, finding similarly situated. So what are the options, that is, for there to be notice approved by the court that lets the court decide if this is a proper enough action to justify notice without basically imposing the cert requirement? Now, the courts are going to scrutinize the whole case. Well, here's what we came up with. You can have a party managed class action. That is, if plaintiff's counsel think they can reach as many plaintiffs as they want, they can just hand out notices, solicit people, let the plaintiff solicit people, and just file the opt-ins and just not send out a broad notice. Is this permissible? Well, yeah. If you go back to 1940, we did a lot of dive into what courts understood this to mean at the time. The defendant argued the plaintiff hasn't been authorized by all the red caps. It was a strange job title um, when they were riding the rails or whatever. Um, it's not essential that everyone authorizes the case. People similarly situated are indispensable parties who are mandatory to join. They're optional joinder. So you can always have a collective action limited to only those who opt in. And it found. Case in 2013, one of the ones citing McClendon that cited their article, no cert motion doesn't mean you dismiss the opt-ins. It just means you didn't need notice. Notice is optional. And there's a case called Genesis from the Supreme Court in 2013 on a different issue. But it said, this important dicta, the sole consequence of certification is notice. Implicitly, that means that if you don't need notice, you don't need certification. That's an implication, at least, of the converse or the inverse. I didn't take philosophy. I don't know which. So, if you need notice, plaintiffs can move for notice, but it's not certification. What's the difference? A denial of notice shouldn't end the collective unless the defendant makes a misjoinder motion or the court's findings in denying notice have preclusive effect. The court found that y'all are too different. What's support for this? Well, the above cases seem to say that collective actions don't require notice. You seek notice if you need it. And one of the early cases, Alderati, again, citing our article, said, um, no cert's needed, but you can certify just as an inquiry before notice to assure notice is accurate. So that is, plaintiffs can seek notice, but it's not permission to have the whole class action. It's permission to send notice, collective action. Um, so um, there's also precedent in other areas. So to rack my brain, does this go on anywhere because 216 be so weird? Interpleader. I hadn't thought about interpleader since Civ Pro, and I barely thought about it there. Under Rule 22, 
and property title disputes under the statute that I never thought about or heard of. It says in the statute, the court may order an absent defendant to appear or plead, published by notice, defendant not notified, can enter later. Look at this decision. The court said that even though people can join without notice, notice is just something we do administratively to make joinder more feasible or facilitated. The court ordered mailed notice under both of these provisions because they had similar interests. So this is something that's done in other areas. That is to say, the requirement of notice doesn't have to imply that you need to certify the whole case. So what about solicitation? Well, it is ambulance chasing, like this guy. Well, there's rules about solicitation. I think it's one of the most over-interpretive rules. In short, 7.3a restricts only in-person live or otherwise live uh, communications. 7.3b or c restricts written or electronic communication only if it's coercive, arises out of an injury or death, or the person already said, leave me alone. Otherwise, you can send written solicitation if it's labeled advertising material. So the short version is that non-court-approved notice and plaintiff's counsel is OK. You can solicit as long as it's non-real time in writing and complies with a couple other strictures here. So solicitation can be done. So next issue, representative evidence. What about plaintiffs who want to litigate a case for others? Do you need the 100 or 1,000 depositions? Well, no, because there are alternatives, and courts have always had discretion over discovery and trial evidence. You could have written disclosures from the plaintiffs, interrogatories. An online questionnaire could be a sworn declaration under 20 U.S. Code 1746. You don't need affidavits in federal court. If you sign something, which can be a scan, you can just assert, declare under penalty of perjury. There's no reason these can't be online submissions by the plaintiffs uh, these days. So you don't need deposition or witness testimony from everybody. Well, is it unfair to the defendants to not have depositions from all the people suing you? Maybe, but I can assure you, there are cases where I've done the 20 or 40 depositions. And I can assure you by about the 20th, they're just reading off a script. There's no further depth being done here. It's basically like written questions or interrogatories. And they'll delegate them to contract attorneys. And therefore, you could do these inquiries without everybody taking the witness stand or being deposed. Are these admissible? Well, there are strictures on written testimony being admissible. But there are options. I've had cases where the defendant stipulated to a piece of paper being admissible as a statement. All hearsay or authentication rules are waivable. And rules 31 and 32 allow different sorts of deposition testimony, including depositions on written questions, which are a lot like interrogatories, to be entered into evidence. So there are options. And existing practice in 216b, it's covered in the paper, courts allow sort of a sliding scale of how many people get deposed. If it's a really big case, the court will say depose 2 to 6%. It's a small case, they'll say depose everybody, or 1 in 5, if it's 100 or 400 people. If interrogatories are attained from everybody, maybe you get fewer depositions. So courts have been handling this already. Courts have already established rules of reason for how many plaintiffs you need to have testify. Yeah. Um, but there's also tactical bellwether trials common in mass tort cases, where mass tort cases, they're unequivocally all individual cases. If you have a pharmaceutical, uh, kills people allegedly or something, or causes damage or cancer, um, the court will say, try these cases first, or the plaintiffs and defendants will agree, we'll try these cases first. There are many options of having a couple trials first out of hundreds or thousands, sometimes just informative. They'll settle if the plaintiffs lose all the first four, the defendants win all the first four. There could be issue preclusion from some finding, um, offensive non-mutual collateral estoppel against the defendant. Or the plaintiffs and defendants can agree that the first four will bind, either in part or in whole. Notably, courts can order a lot of this. Courts can order uh, to have a couple first and see what happens. Or courts can facilitate the effort of preclusion. And finally, courts can do bifurcate cases. If you try the liability phase first, was there a violation? Well, you're deferring more of the more individualized issues that require everyone's testimony until the end. What were your hours? What was your exact pay? What are your records? So you can actually avoid, in a lot of different ways, having everybody testify and produce documents if you manage it right. And courts have enough discretion to do that. So finally, on settlement, there are ethics rules that the clients must approve settlement. So when I first looked into this, I was pleasantly surprised that courts have a lot more discretion about um, representative evidence. And there are fewer restrictions on solicitation than I realized. I was surprised at how hard it is to authorize a group settlement if it's not a class action. Lawyers shall abide by a client's decision, must remain the client's ultimate authority, and there are cases finding it 
sanctionable or impermissible to delegate settlement authority to a lawyer or even in the Tenth Circuit. You, plaintiffs can't delegate settlement authority to a committee of plaintiffs. It's important that the final decision be ratified by each individual in a non-class action. And if a 216B isn't a class action, maybe you can't have a group settlement. So we have some answers to this, though, and they're partial. Uh, we're taking this case, though, as a given, because unlike Judge Kane, I can't just send it up on appeal and <laughs> see if uh, they'll agree with me. Um, you can have limited delegation. If it's in a retainer agreement or in the opt-in form that contains a mini retainer agreement, which a lot of lawyers have started doing, and a retainer agreement can delegate to the lawyer and named plaintiffs the power to negotiate a proposal. It can say that the plaintiff be given notice of any proposed settlement with the right to opt out. And it can, and this is the adventurous part, say that if you got notice and you declined to opt out, that's consent to settle. That only works if you agree to that in the retainer, but I looked up some contract law. You can agree that if you get notice of something and don't opt out, then it takes effect, it renews, what have you. So that's what can be done. It has to be in a retainer of some kind. And then the court can exercise some scrutiny over this. Not as much as Rule 23, but here's a case in the Tenth Circuit, New Mexico v. Amont. It's a water dispute that went on decades, non-class but a thousand parties. When there was a settlement and it was controversial, the court said, we're not going to pine about the substance here, but we'll scrutinize and we'll mandate some changes to the procedures. We'll look at whether there was good faith, arm's length negotiation, whether anyone was prejudiced by not being fully included and notified, whether there's any due process problem the defendant wasn't given, and whether there's any prejudice that overcomes the broad policy that if it's not a class action, you can settle on any terms you want under Rule 41. So we think that's what the courts can do in 216Bs, is make sure things were done above board, but they don't get to scrutinize the substance of the settlement. So in short, this is our summary. Uh, that the plaintiffs can litigate and solicit without a certain motion, or they can seek notice. Defendants can challenge as misjoinder. They can get sample discovery representative, and they can settle globally. It's usually the defendants, actually, that are much more keen on having the settlement be global. So they're the ones who are upset, not the plaintiffs, by the lack of a global settlement. And judges can assess joinder and settlement if defendant files a motion, plaintiff seeks notice, or there are questions about propriety of a settlement. What they can't do is just supervise the whole thing like a Rule 23 class. And they can manage representative evidence. So instead of me a catchy little acronym for this, so we came up with the summary of all this, because it's kind of a monstrosity, is CARP, con Consent, Authority, and Rights Provisions. I really wanted to call it Consent, Rights, and Authority Provisions, but Nantia vetoed that. Um, <laughs> And it means that basically, if you codify that the plaintiffs get all the relevant notice of their right to opt out, of their right to their delegating authority to settle, uh, but that they'll be deemed to settle if they don't opt out of a settlement they got fair notice of, and that they have the right to be notified of all major case events, and that they have the ability, if they want, to get different lawyers or litigate individually, <laughs> sort of disclaimer, then this will hold up that you can litigate these together um, not necessarily as a collection of individual cases. And I have a flow chart. Um, this is basically this as a visual. Um, most of us went to law school because we don't love visuals. That's why this took me like two days to figure out how to do. Um, but you know, we tried to have it as a visual. And what it basically shows is that if plaintiffs don't want notice, they can have this party one class action. If they do, then the grant or denial of notice doesn't mean that the case ends. It just means there's not notice given. But it all comes back to a retainer giving opt-in plaintiffs full disclosure of what they are, what their rights are. Because if it's not obvious to the courts what these cases are, it's certainly not obvious to the plaintiffs. So we think this would be good practice. Um, remarkably, when I proposed this to the plaintiffs bar, they were actually really receptive uh, to the idea that they'd have these duties to send these notices out. Some were doing close to it, most weren't. I Googled around the country, and most aren't doing anything like this. When plaintiffs sign an opt-in form that the counsel files in the court, um, it just says, I'm litigating a case. I think plaintiffs' lawyers are setting themselves up for a world of hurt when you undertake to represent someone with no clear delineation of your duties. And I think that somewhat upset the judges in this third category where they said, if it's not a class action, we're troubled by sort of free range litigation, uh, almost, you know, Montessori school litigation. Everybody discover whatever you want out of this and do what you want. That doesn't fly. We need some protections and some assurance this is going on right. So we're optimistic that this could. Um, you know, yield some best practices. We're going to share it with the plaintiffs and defense bar and judges too. Um, so that's uh, our 2012 article, our 2019 article, and um, we'll see how that one goes over. Thanks. So 
um, I don't know the exact schedule, but um, open for thoughts, questions, feelings. Rick? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. Um, the Supreme Court has done almost nothing with 216Bs. They seem to barely notice they exist. Um, we're kind of fine with that um, because I don't know what they would do. Um, what you're bringing up is that, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom where district judges do one thing, circuits say another. The Tenth Circuit was pretty deferential. Um, it's possible within the next 10 years, as these controversies grow, the practice area has grown, courts are noticing. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we see the court take on a case of this sort and for what you're saying, the courts are allowing class actions to be diverted into arbitration. Um, arbitration can apply to these as well. Um, I think there's a hostility to large litigation that pervades the court's attitude in the arbitration cases, so I don't know which way that it cut here. Um, I think one way it could cut is that I think district judges and the lawyers who want to litigate these cases need to be mindful of the fact that there are going to be more and more judges who are skeptical of what they're doing and think they might be up to no good. The Supreme Court is not going to assume good faith on the part of plaintiff's lawyers. So I think that might cut more in favor, as I think about it, of having some sort of best practice as opposed to, hey, I'm a lawyer. If you want to join, literally sign this card, and we'll file it in the court, and let the chips fall where they may, and hope the court doesn't think we're up to shenanigans. It could, but anecdotally what I've heard is that defense has been very gung-ho. Um, there's one lawyer I know who, um, she really liked my article and now she hates it because she has multiple of these FLSA collective actions. They're all with the one judge that most aggressively ruled, you're all individuals, depose everybody, settle individually. I'm very skeptical what plaintiff's counsel are doing, so they need to go back and get retainers from everybody. It's been kind of a nightmare. Um, the defendants have been very aggressive in saying, oh, we can take depositions from everybody? Yeah, let's do that. Um, we want over 100 depositions. Um, I'm sure there are going to be exceptions. There are exceptions getting back to arbitration, Rick's point. There's one um, case I got a leaked email from a guy who was an arbitrator uh, where it's against Amex, not a consumer case, where Amex said you can't have a class action for a long time. Everything goes into individual arbitration. That was their policy. Ha <laughs> ha, they defeated Rule 23. Well, one firm said, okay, we got a mail merge going or a cookie cutter going. We're going to file 1,000 individual consumer claims, 5,000 individual consumer claims. Amex then said, are you kidding me? We have to pay arbitrators fees for 5,000 claims on a 50-buck claim? The arbitrator ruled, well, you know what? It's you jabronis that decided that you don't want class actions. You want individual arbitrations. Have at it, Amex. Right? I could see that argument applying here, which is that a lot of wage claims are worth 50 or 500 to 1,000 bucks each. The cost of a deposition transcript, let alone attorney time, is a thousand bucks, right? Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if, in the long run, defendants decide this isn't any, doing anybody any favors. Um, but yeah, I'm surprised we haven't seen more of that.
Yeah, it tells us a lot. And it's funny because I, I feel like if you go to plaintiff side, employment lawyers, the union side, labor lawyers, you'll never meet more legal realist members of the bar. They know all too well how uh, people get screwed. And you know, one of my favorite quotes that I've used, and I purloined it from somebody I've long since forgotten, but as an old boss of mine said, there's no such thing as plagiarism in the law. He does something like, you file five lawsuits to make things better, knowing that you're going to get your ass kicked in four of them, and you do it for the fifth. You just don't know which will be the fifth as of when you file it. And could there be a backlash if you win too many? Yes. Um, I think here, though, um, on the net, things are a little better. I'm quite cheesed off about category three in those cases. But I think, A, this article expanded the possibilities for sympathetic judges like Judge Kane and some others who decided, great, you can just have at it. These cases start to finish. Just move on like collections cases almost. Um, B, there's an interesting mass of cases I mentioned in the paper but not out loud, which is that a favorite tactic of some savvy plaintiff's lawyers is saying, um, motion um, that certification is unnecessary or in the alternative for certification, saying something like, we think this suffices for certification and this district court's existing precedents counsel in favor of that. However, if you deny certification, we'll appeal because we think it's impermissible. So we suggest you certify. Basically, it's as if they're saying the district judges um, grant the certification or you might be overturned not just on getting cert wrong, but in that maybe you didn't have to. It's almost like this, uh, plaintiff's lawyers can now say to the district judges, it's a nice uh, record on appeal you got there. It'd be a shame if anything happened to it, huh? So it's given another argument in favor of certification. And um, there are a number of judges, Judge Arguello issued some decision like that. Martinez issued some decision like that. Now, that said, I'm under no delusion the best argument convinces most people most of the time, or even some people some of the time. So there are a couple of judges, let's call you know, them Judge Schmiegler or something, and in the D Colorado, where there's no argument that's going to convince her or him that this is an argument that should be made. Um, and you know, you're not going to convince him or her, but um, the hope is they convince some of the judges some of the time. The judges didn't going to maximally screw you based on this article. They were already going to screw you. Realism. They were already um, going to find a way that the plaintiff loses. Um, so I think it's made things marginally better. You know, but maybe one um, answer I have in my mind is that I'm a half a loaf, quarter loaf kind of guy. Given that I expected zero impact of anything I ever wrote, um, you know, if it helps a couple of cases go better, then you know, yay, I'll you know, uh, declare victory because the glass is 10% full or something. It's helped somewhat, but absolutely, this is absolutely a case study in legal realism and how you know, something that should go one way goes the other way by judges predisposed toward that. Yeah. Helen? Yeah, I mean, most of my practice in the area was undocumented immigrants, allegedly undocumented immigrants. Sorry, Ice, if you're listening. Um, allegedly undocumented immigrants not getting paid their wages. Because, yes, there's a class of overtime violations that are for claims adjusters, people paid 50000 a year. Uh, what got me into this was representing people not getting paid minimum or getting paid low enough to minimum that the lack of overtime is a real problem or low enough to minimum that when they're deprived of a half hour here and there, they're really below the minimum. So. That's one case. My first case I had of this was a, a thousand supermarket delivery in New York, um, African immigrants, by which I mean right from Africa, living four people in a studio who were getting paid 70 to 100 bucks a week for a 60 to 80 hour week. They worked for tips basically, which they didn't always get. Um, there were undocumented, allegedly Chinese immigrants in a Donna Karen sweatshop in Manhattan. Right? So it's not just outsourcing. It was a garbage building in Manhattan that Donna Karen outsourced to. And the press conference beforehand was us with the bullhorn outside the Donna Karen corporate offices. Um, the Chinese uh, Staff Work Association uh, brought the bullhorn and somehow had this awesome chant with a poster with Donna Karen with fangs drawn on her, in which they somehow made Donna Karen rhyme with DKNY, rhyme with greedy, uh, which was sort of a feat itself. Um, or more recently, the case I had with Judge Kane, it was a allegedly undocumented immigrant who was a cook, paid 12 bucks an hour for uh, 77 hours a week. But he's called the kitchen manager, so he didn't get overtime for that. Um, and these are also cases where another cubbyhole area litigated was, you know, my life's mission in some of these cases was getting decisions that every defense counsel in these cases wants discovery into my client's immigration status. Because though they damn well knew, they are shocked, shocked like Captain Renault and Casablanca to discover they're undocumented immigrants in these establishments. And they want discovery, sworn depositions, and derogatory response into immigration status. So yeah, no, I, the thing, you know, that I'm most excited about that I've done this area is that I got the first report decision in the country saying immigration status is non-discoverable in a wage claim in 2002. That was the Donna Karen case. And 13, uh, I got the first report decision in Colorado saying that 
immigration decision, status is non-discoverable in a wage claim. And by the first, I mean it's because the Supreme Court opened the door to this in a horrible 2002 decision. But yeah, it's basically immigrant, it's based in immigrant rights areas of law, area of law. And I gave that short shrift in this talk because um, and a lot else to say and to summarize two articles. But the first article is all about how this is really important. It's not about procedure. Uh, what gets me up in the morning isn't procedure. It's that it's an outrage. These folks aren't paid. And that there are these barriers that are almost entirely arbitrary in some context that keep them from not getting anything. Sorry, one of the high horse there. But thanks for the invite, too. Good questions, thoughts, feelings, objections? Okay. Time for the reception. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott.